Item four, questions to the leader. The number one question, Councillor Hogg. Question number one to the leader. Mr Mayor, I thank Councillor Hogg for his question. When I was reading the question, I, I thought there was a kind of a joke in it. Um, this idea that the Labour group had actually a message on affordable housing. Because the message that I remember the previous cycle was that they were opposed to producing, for this council, producing 60% affordable housing in a programme of building 1,000 homes on our land using our money. Uh, subsequently, of course, it took a one cycle of internal debate, I guess, in the, in the Labour Party to, for them to concoct uh, an excuse for a flip-flop and suggest that they could, in fact, uh, um, amend that suggestion, increase the percentage, lose the vote, and then back the Conservative proposition as they should have done in the first place. A full supplementary, Councillor Hogg, if you wish. A supplementary, Mr Mayor. I was expecting a slightly fuller answer, but I'm, I'm surprised that the leader tries to defend the status quo. I mean, this isn't about numbers. You know, developers building what they like, selling it overseas to um, investors, um, dodging their responsibilities, such as cutting 250 affordable homes at Bassey's power station. The Tories are consistently putting the interests of property developers ahead of local people. And it's time for a change, for a system that puts... Can we have a question? I'm coming to that, Mr. Mayor. Um, the delivery of affordable housing for local people at its heart. Does at least part of him see that viability assessment should be public? Does he agree that all planning applications, committee meetings should be broadcast live? And does he agree that no councillors should accept hospitality from property developers? Mr. Mayor, Councillor Hogg sort of says this is not about numbers. Well, in fact, his question is entirely about numbers. When you read it, there are at least four numbers in there and asking about numbers. And in fact, talking about housing delivery numbers, this borough has the sixth highest number of affordable housing in London. This borough has delivered 326 affordable homes, when in fact neighbouring Merton has delivered nine. So if you're talking about record of delivery, this council does have as an incredibly good record of delivery of affordable homes. In fact, not only is there a record of delivery, there is a commitment to deliver more and more and more. And in fact, it is that commitment that the Labour Party has not supported us on. In fact, I read in today's evening standard that the Lab Lambeth uh, Labour Party is about to consider a planning application for a block of flats on the riverside in South Bank where they are about to approve a 10% of delivery of affordable homes. Mr. The London Mayor approved 9% delivery of affordable homes in Redbridge. Croydon, which often members opposite praise for its delivery of housing, has actually delivered such few affordable homes that the Mayor has had to step in to, to, to correct that. So, Mr. Mayor, I'm not taking lectures from the party opposite. We have a consistent record of building homes for people of this borough, and this is one that we are committed to, and we have had very little support, or in fact none, from the party opposite. Second, Second supplementary. supplementary. Councillor Houston. Uh, the leader with me. Um, the Labour Party's memory on this is too good, is it? Because the last time they had control of this council, they set up property purchases to go around and buy up houses so they didn't have social housing. The country boys, they were so successful. Councillor, your mic. They were so successful this year that they, they could. Again, can we get on? Uh, uh, thank uh, Councillor Heaster for his question. And I think I entirely agree with Councillor Heaster that it is not a record that we would like to emulate. And in fact, the, 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 the Labour policy of the 70s that he mentions is something that we all do remember, and many of us are in this country. And in fact, it's so useless that even the Ballam Law Centre actually opposed 
Labour Party's proposals to buy up properties, leave them boarded, empty and useless to the local residents. In fact, echoes of that policy was sort of heard in Jeremy Corbyn's recent announcement that he was about to commit the Labour Party to purchase 8,000 properties, street properties, for exactly the same purpose. I guess another commitment of capital funds to purchase properties and then there is no revenue funds to repair and, may, and, and give, put them to use. So I'm afraid what goes around seems to be coming around, but it's not going to come around in this borough. Question two to the leader. Thank Councillor Hogg for his um, question. Uh, well, uh, the printed answer says that this is a, a question that has been asked before, and there is an answer that has been given before, uh, and I'm surprised that uh, Councillor Hogg has chosen to use his second question to, to repeat a, a statement and seek assurance for his from me, which he already should have had in the first place. What a waste of an opportunity, I guess. But what I think I sort of, I was talking earlier to Councillor Elias who, who reminded me that um, the London living wage uh, appeared in a debate last night in the adult uh, social services OSC and um, Councillor Critchard uh, uh, moved uh, the suggestion that uh, uh, workers in the care services. I haven't yet actually said anything about you other than oh, that you've spoken. You speak so often yeah. that uh, uh, yeah. I should well, simply not mention say. your name. Let, let, me, let me make my point first. Uh, <laughs> well, well, I think if I say Councillor Critchard, she'll pop up like a jack-in-the-box yet again, I guess. There you go. She said that she was prepared to pay, uh, she wanted the council to pay the home workers uh, working on contract a London living wage. When challenged about the cost of that and how the Labour Party might fund it, she said she was not interested in other workers, only the home care workers. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a curious way of developing a policy for pet subjects or pet workers. So Mr. Mayor, again, I think our position is very clear. People who work for this council get and should get London living wage and that's our commitment and we've made that. In fact when it comes to our contractors it is a matter for the contractors and their staff. And when it comes to future procurement we may want to in fact tighten up on this but for the moment our commitment is that the contractors should live by their legal obligations and we will take an opportunity at a future point. Before we move to supplementaries, Councillor Grichard. Well thank you, thank you Mr Mayor. One of the things that is quite interesting is this debate is being reported without the minutes. The minutes will actually say that what was requested by the Labour team was that as part of the consideration of the home care contract, that, mem that the, the council should consider what would happen if the London living wage was implemented. What members, what was not accepted that it was even worth looking at what the possible costs were, whether this might possibly be a useful move, because there are other benefits to the London living wage. That was actually what the amendment was. The amendment was not necessarily that it would be paid, but you should consider what it was. And I must say, I was quite gratified because one of the officers said, well, it might be about a million pounds. Well, actually, myself, I'd got about one and a half million in my head, so I'm probably not too far out. Just remember, the point was it should be considered. Can we keep it this pretty brief. Cabinet, this, this council says it is excellent, very good at financial prudence. Uh, well, but you know we're what we're doing. Off the uh, <coughs> we're verging away from the point of personal explanation. I think well, that's I'm probably been well covered. Say, we no, we're not going to talk about that now. Women, we're going to give your leader the chance to ask his question. Councillor Hogg, first, supplementary if you wish. Uh, supplementary, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, I mean, appears to be some confusion about our position. I mean, just to be clear, Wandsworth Labour will pay all council workers, staff or contracts, the London living wage of £10.20 an hour. And I would hope we could get consensus on this important issue because I, I think all of us believe that uh, a hard day's work deserves a fair day's pay. Um, now, we can try and pay the minimum we possibly can under the the weird right-wing dogma you've put into your answer, but how about we actually pay people uh, an amount that they can live on? Will the leader 
reconsider joining us in implementing this important pay rise for the people who clean our streets, who prepare our children's school meals and who care for elderly and vulnerable people. In fact, the printed answer asks uh, Councillor Hogg the honesty of approach. Will he be honest and tell local residents what is the cost of his promise? Evidently, he's not going to. I'm asking the question. Second, 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 yes, Councillor Bolton. Does the leader recall, as I will do, when I asked a similar question of uh, his predecessor, who said, uh, uh, what the contractors pay is of no concern of mine, um, and does he still think that's the case when we've got Carillion as an example of what happens when uh, they don't sort out the money in a reasonable way, when they're encouraged to compete for tenders at the lowest possible price regardless of, uh, uh, of any payments to anyone, what happens when capita gets into trouble, what happens when, in fact, without, with a little bit of bad luck, we face similar issues in this council. Will he then think that we haven't been thorough enough on making sure that our contractors stick to reasonable standards? I think Councillor Belton for his supplement, I mean, as far as uh, what my predecessor may have said and may not have said, I'm really not responsible for every nuance of for his statement. But one thing I do know is that this council has been consistent in many procuring, putting the interest of rate by as residents at the heart of the procurement to get good quality, sustainable quality of services for the duration of the contract and prepare the, for the subsequent procurement so that we have established a benchmark of service quality and standards. And of course, as a part of that, we have to make sure that the contractor is going to be both stable and capable of delivering those services over the period of that contract. This council has a history of being quite robust with contractors in making sure that the contracts are monitored and and services are provided and where they are found wanting that they have been charged and even when, when necessary contracts have been terminated as early as in the in the, in the mid 80s we, we, we terminated a cleaning contract where it was found to be wanting and similarly we have offered it of late done same with number of contracts in the children's services so we're not afraid of holding contractors to account what we are committed to is providing quality services to our residents in a sustainable way over the period of the contract. Uh, <coughs> question number three, Councillor Peterkin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Number three to the leader. I thank Councillor Peterkin for his question. Uh, it's a matter of kind of sadness, isn't it, that in the week that uh, we mark 100 years of the beginning of giving women the vote, that the senior most woman in local government found herself incapable of continuing in the job that she was elected by her group for. There wasn't a debate that led to her decision to stand down. It was almost a diktat that made, it her, made her task impossible. It is actually a slur on our democracy that somebody as committed as that, somebody who actually saved that local authority from a disastrous baby peace scandal, has now been treated in such an appalling way. And not so much that it wasn't a question of awaiting the electorate's judgment, but it was just that her, ma her life was made difficult. She'd been cut out of the knees and let to sort of stump around uh, as, a, as a useless appendage of, of the Labour group in Haringey. It is incredibly sad, I think. I mean, I feel disappointed. Claire is somebody I do know and have worked with very, very, very well. She's somebody who has the interest of London at heart. And I think it is time that those who feel this is wrong stand up and say so, as 70 other Labour le leaders and opposition leaders have said it. Because if we are silent when Haringey is abused, where we're silent when Newham is abused, then, you know, we will find that when we are abused, there's nobody to speak up for us. Uh, supplemental, Mr. Mayor. Um, th I thank the Leader for his response. Um, does he share my specific disappointment at not seeing the Leader of the op Opposition's name on the letter I referred to in my earlier question? And does he share my twin concerns that that omission may be interpreted as indifference to such abhorrent behaviour? And secondly, that one interpretation capable of being put on that omission is that he's being held hostage by extreme elements within his own local party. 
So I thank Councillor Peterkin for his question. I mean, I, I can understand why he puts those three possibilities as, the re as an explanation why Councillor Hogg's name was not on the list. Let me be charitable about this because I do think uh, these things happen in, in, in this thing. When a, a circular comes out saying to all the people, will you put your signature on a letter uh, by, and let me have your answer by you know, the end of the day or something. And uh, it's sometimes quite difficult to, to, to meet the deadline. Uh, I hope that it is that. And therefore, the Councillor Hogg will take the opportunity to say that now that I have considered it, I will append my name to that letter. And I think that is the opportunity that he should take this evening. If it is the other that he feels incapable of signing because he might be criticized by his group or his group may not approve his name being on the list, then that is a matter on which he must be honest with the residents of this borough as to which one is it. Is it oversight because of pressure work or is it uh, that the group may not wear his name on a list of support for Claire Kirby's position at Haringey? Is there a second? Is that right? I think it just uh, is worth saying that this is a, a dangerous path for um, the leaders to be going down. Uh, obviously, the Conservative Party is split right down the middle. Jacob Rees-Mogg pulling off in one direction, Theresa May in the other one. On this side of the chamber, on this side of the chamber, we are united. We are absolutely united in Wandsworth. Uh, so I'd, I'd ask. I'd ask the leader. I'd ask the. I'd ask the leader uh, and his team to focus on business that relates to this council. That is what we are doing, preparing for taking control in May. Mr. Mayor, that perhaps tells us the dilemma the leader of opposition has. He hasn't got actually the support of his group to come out and say one way or the other. I will sign a letter or I will not sign the letter. His silence says everything there is to say. <laughs> Question four to the leader, please, Mr. Mayor. I thank um, Councillor Ambash for his question. I, again, I mean, I rely on Councillor Senior's memory of this discussion that there was no debate in, in when the budget was discussed at Earth Cross. It's not unusual this year, because it's every year the same, that the budgets are, the single budget of the Council is discussed and debated and voted at F Cross can then hear and then subsequently the budget is, is sort of uh, analyzed and assessed at OSCs in, in, in f at future occasions. And of course there are regular monitorings and reviews of the budgets. And of course budgets get amended through the years. So there's no attempt here to gag Councillor Ambash. In fact, if he felt gagged, I'm surprised he hasn't taken the opportunity of being a speaker on the matters of finance to be considered later on this evening. And I thank the leader for his answer and I particularly want to follow up about children's services recovery and I wonder if he agrees that the recovery of our children's services is not a quick fix but needs more a uh, longer term sustained approach and surely it's wrong that with less than two months to go we don't know the financial plan for the recovery of children's services from next April and with just 4.2 million left in the recovery reserves, more may be needed in the recovery financially in the next financial year, 18 and 19. So will he promise to take a longer term planning financial perspective? Uh, and if needed, will he increase the reserve if more is needed in the following financial year, 1819? Uh, Thank you, Councillor Ambash, for the opportunity to say something about the uh, Children's Services uh, Improvement Journey. You will know yourself by being a member and, and a good and a diligent member uh, of, of that improvement board that just from the start of the journey to now, it is an incremental journey of improvement. It's not there yet but it has been a consistent and incremental journey of improvement. Thanks to the leadership of the director and some very committed staff in, in her team, this journey is 
I, my, my view, a, a very good progress uh, and, and perhaps a kind of progress that we may not have thought was possible at the start. The second part of the thing is that this council had made an absolute commitment at the start of this journey that it will be, that it will be well resourced and it will not stumble for lack of cash. And that has been the position of this council from the very beginning. And I am surprised that you feel the need to doubt that commitment because that commitment has been made repeatedly here and elsewhere. But our, our commitment to that journey, commitment to resourcing that journey is unflinching. And as far as the reserves are concerned, they're there. The adequate reserves to actually take us through to the next stage. And I think the best part of not only next year, but a little bit beyond, is what we, I would expect that that, those, that reserve will take us. And as I said before, if it is necessary, this council has not shied away from resourcing the, that improvement journey because we put huge, huge effort about getting it right. Second supplementary? If not?